Uh, Jörg, thank you very much for the kind introduction, dear colleagues. Um, before I start with my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here today. And uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I would like to give you a quick overview about the current uh, trans catheter edge edge-to-edge -edge repair devices and um, some details about clinical uh, outcome data. And um, the last minute, just a minute, is about the trans catheter mitral annular plasty. And uh, why is just a minute? I would like to explain you during my presentation. Um, I would like to start with uh, some fundamentals, and in the second part, I would like to show you some um, nice movies about uh, the techniques and also one uh, case presentation about a patient which we have treated with uh, tear devices. And uh, as mentioned before, the last part is uh, annular plus tear devices. Um, before I start with uh, the um, technical details of transcatheter edge to edge repair device, I would like to uh, tell you some um, comments about the current development about um, new research in the uh, mitral regurgitation uh, area, and that is what we know or what we see very often. Um, a patient which is 60, uh, 86 years old with a severe prolapse uh, with uh, a lot of uh, comorbidities, which is not the favorable candidate uh, to perform surgery due to the comorbidities. And what I like more focus, because that's a very big part of our practical um, work, uh, is the secondary microregurgitation. And currently, we have three different pathomechanisms mechanisms for secondary mitral regurgitation, and the first one is the atrial functional MR, and that is mostly characterized by a dilatation of the left atrium, which leads, uh, which leads to a dilatation of the mitral annulus, and you can see very nicely the patient has a very good left ventricular ejection fraction and severe dilated annulus, and that is completely different to this pathology, which we have treated some years before, the non-ischemic functional MR, like the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or the ischemic functional mitral rotation, and both uh, pathologies are mostly characterized by a very severe impaired left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, the reason why, I would, why I'd like to show you uh, this is that the atrial functional MR is one of the most increasing pathology which we are treating currently with tear devices. And the reason is that the patients are older and older, have long time uh, atrial uh, fibrillation, and that is a new group which we are treating since five years uh, more and more. Uh, what you can see here very nicely is the impact on the prognosis of um, the different pathologies uh, on the, um, like the uh, survival of the patients. The blue curve uh, is the normal uh, life expectancy of the patients, and here you can see for the atrial and also for the ventricular function MR had the mitral a severe impact on the survival. But the current problem is that just only four or three percent of this uh, group are treated by um, are treated by surgery, and the reason for that is that the most of the patients with mitral regurgitation are older than 75 years old. And what you can see very nicely on this um, figure is that in this uh, area we have a significant increase of the surgical risk due to comorbidities, uh, etc., and that leads to an um, to a need for new therapeutic options. And here you can see we have a long list of different um, reasons for uh, to, uh, to perform um, transcatheter uh, procedures. And the current devices which we are using in the clinical routine are the tear devices and uh, the analoplasty devices. Um, some basic principles about uh, TIR, that is a transfemoral, uh, transeptal approach for the treatment of uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, you, here you can see that we um, uh, come from the vena cava inferior and then a transeptal puncture. We are placing a uh, guide catheter inside of the left atrium, and about this uh, guide catheter, we can place uh, the implant, and then we can grasp both leaflets, and the tear device is mimics, but you can see on the left side the uh, surgical aphiaresis uh, with the adaptation of the anterior and the uh, posterior mitral leaflet. Um, you have different options to steer the device. You can rotate the device. You can steer to the lateral, to the medial side. And uh, the best um, um, 
option is to place the device directly in the target zone with the uh, yeah, most uh, mitral regurgitation area, and then uh, the system allows an independent leaflet grasping. That means you can close and open the device, and you can re-grasp the leaflets. Um, the technology is um, not very new. It's introduced first time in uh, 2003 uh, with the beginning of the Everest 1 trial, and currently we have the fourth generation of the MitraClip, what you can see on the right side. Sorry. What you can see on the right side, we have currently four different sizes uh, of the MitraClip, and then we have a new player in the field that is the Edwards Pascal device. And um, what are the main differences between both systems? Um, both systems are 24 French, transfemoral, transeptal access, but the material of the clip is different between both devices. On the, for the microclip, it's a cobalt chrome clip, and on the, for the Pascal device, it's a nitinol uh, clip. And you can see that the nitinol is uh, super elastic and leads uh, to the effect that the, um, the clip allows a slightly opening of the mitral valve during the uh, diastole, and that reduces the uh, gra uh, mean gradient uh, of the mitral clip after the uh, mitral clip or the uh, tear procedure. Also, the Pascal device is available in two sizes. Uh, one size is 10 millimeters uh, of width, and the second, it's a smaller one, is 5 millimeter of uh, width. And you can see that both um, uh, devices have different characteristics. Uh, the MitraClip, the steering is uh, excellent with this device, and uh, the MitraClip has a uh, very strong grasping force. But uh, the uh, advantage of the Pascal device is, that, uh, is the fact that this device is more atraumatic, and you can. And the decision between both devices depends, uh, for example, on the tissue characteristics. If you have a very uh, severe tethered uh, posterior uh, mitral leaflet, then it's better to use a more atraumatic uh, tear device. And if you have a very severe prolapse, uh, it's, from our point of view, better to treat this pathology with a mitral clip. Uh, that are some uh, details about the uh, safetyness of uh, these devices. You can see that all cause death, and this uh, big registry of an all commerce group is uh, in hospital mortality of 2 to 3 percent. And you can also see that these devices are very effective uh, at 30 days. We have an effecti uh, effectiveness uh, based on the mitral grade. Uh, grade one or less is around uh, 85 to 90 percent after the uh, procedure. Um, what you can see in the latest registries that the combination of uh, different devices and different sizes doing one procedure leads also to an improvement of the uh, reduction of mitral regurgitation. You can see in the latest expand G4 registry, we have nearly 90 percent of uh, patients after 30 days with an MR grade one or less uh, after the procedure. Uh, also, and that is also known from our clinic experience, that, the, that we can see a learning curve. That means that with the experience and the using of this technology, we can see an increase of the procedural success. Uh, and this example based on the MR uh, uh, grade less than or one or less. Uh, you can see in the early, uh, in the middle 2005 to 2010, just only 50% has an MR grade one or less, and currently uh, with the latest generation we can achieve uh, 90%. Um, that is very well known. Uh, a very important study uh, of the treatment uh, of functional mitral regurgitation. Both studies have compared the medical treatment with the medical treatment and uh, clip implantation. You can see that we have Two landmark trials on the left side is the Mitra FR trial, which have shown no differences between both groups. And on the right side, you can see a very significant improvement uh, in uh, the uh, primary endpoint defined by death or heart failure rehospitalization. And you can see that the treatment of uh, functional MR leads uh, to a dramatical effect on the survival. But what is the reason uh, for the differences between both studies? 
And you can see that on this left chart, which have uh, compared the MITRE FR and the co-op study, and you can see very nicely that in the co-op study, the effective regurgitation area was compared to the MITRE FR uh, more with a mean of uh, 41 square millimeter compared to 31 square millimeter. That means the patients in the co-op study has a severe uh, mitral regurgitation. And on the other hand, you can see this on the left end diastolic volume index. That means the left ventricle in the mitral FKR group was much poorer compared with the co-op group. And that is uh, the reason why the, sorry, why the main conclusion of both studies is that the, sorry, the best effect uh, of the treatment of functional microrogitation uh, we can achieve if we have a patient with a not severely impaired left ventricular ejection fraction, which is defined as more than 20%, and a left ventricular and systolic diameter of less than 70 millimeters and a very severe mitral regurgitation. And if you don't have a severe mitral regurgitation, then you can see very nicely the prognosis is more based on the function of the left ventricle and not on the mitral uh, regurgitation. Um, the co-op trial have also shown us that these uh, patients have a very good long-time survival. The data are, really, uh, are very stable after three years. You can see here uh, for the heart failure rehospitalization uh, a big difference and an improvement of, uh, in the group of the patients which were treated by mitroclip and also for the all-cause uh, death. Uh, what is the Achilles tendon of these patients? You can see that the residual mitral regurgitation predicts the clinical outcome. Here you can see if you have a mitral regurgitation of uh, more than grade two or grade three, then you can see that this has a very prognostic relevant uh, influence of the uh, mortality after the procedure. That means it's very important that during the procedure we should achieve and results of grade one or less. Uh, that is also not for the uh, functional mitral regurgitation. It's also an influence or impact on the degenerative mitral regurgitation, which shown, uh, which showing in this uh, investigation. You can see that in both groups, uh, in residual mitral regurgitation direct after the procedure has a huge impact on the survival of the patient. Um, this newest device, the Pascal uh, device, has also some excellent clinical results. And what I like to mention is, or to point out, is the survival. Uh, the red curve is the survival for the uh, functional mitral regurgitation, and the black curve is for degenerative mitral regurgitation. You can see that uh, just after one year, uh, we have a survival of nearly 90% in the functional group. It's a group with a mean age of uh, 72 years old, uh, years, and uh, for the degenerative group, uh, the age is nearly 81 years, and for this, uh, you have a survival of uh, approximately 97%, uh, and which is, for this patient, a very, clinical, a very good clinical result. Uh, some words about the safety of this technology. This is an um, uh, analysis of the STS ACC TVT registries. Uh, 30,000 uh, patients were included uh, in this analysis, and you can see that uh, in the 30 day uh, complication rate is very less uh, stroke, just 1%, uh, and also single lifted detachment, also just 1%, and all the other. Uh, complications like device thrombosis or device emulation is very, very low and not clinical significant. Um, in the next uh, two minutes, I would like to show you one clinical example from our clinical practice. Um, a patient which is uh, six, uh, 86 years old, um, has a three uh, vessel disease, uh, is status post uh, coronary artery bypass grafting in 2005. Uh, the comorbidities are COPD, and the clinical presentation is in severe dyspnea, uh, NIHA class S3. And here you can see the severe uh, prolapse of the P2 segment. Uh, the strategy for this patient is to place two Pascal devices directly in this um, P2 uh, area and to um, 
to uh, uh, fix both leaflets in this area, uh, the anterior leaflet and also the posterior leaflet by the Pascal uh, device. Um, this is an, an, a clinical example. Ah, I cannot move on. I have no tastatur here, I can't. But I can't even spell it, sonst. <laughs> Okay, um, I believe it's, it's a little bit too long, the movie, because, um, yeah, können Sie vielleicht vorspulen auf die zweite Minute? Okay, yeah, this is okay. Um, here you can see uh, we have placed the first device uh, between the anterior and the posterior leaflet, and you can see that this device has a very severe mobility, and that is not a single leaflet detachment. That is pretty normal, because uh, the high mobility of the posterior leaflet leads to, leads to the effect that this device uh, is after the first implantation of the first device, uh, you can see that we have a high mobility, and that is the reason why we are placing in the most of the patient a second device, and the effect is to stabilize the first device, and uh, the second effect is to reduce uh, also the residual mitral irritation. And here you can see we have placed the second device directly or lateral from the first device, that is the first device, and uh, on the lateral side is the second device, and now we have removed uh, the implant catheter. You can see very nicely in this picture that we have uh, stabilized the first device, and in this case we have uh, just only a trace residual mitral rotation, which is a very excellent result for a patient which is 86 years old. But for the long-time prognosis, I'm a cardiac surgeon and I'm a strong believer on uh, aneuploplasty. That means, um, from my point of view, this is only a treatment option for very old patients or high-risk patients. And for the long-time prognosis, like the durability of 10 to 20 years, uh, an aneuploplasty is uh, needed. Uh, what are telling us the current guidelines? Um, the guidelines telling us that the tier devices uh, are currently recommended for primary regurgitation in inoperable and high-risk patients, for secondary or functional mitral regurgitation only in patients which are not eligible um, for surgery, and also just only for patients which are fulfilling the co-op criteria, the selection criteria for this patient group. And these are the current main indications for the uh, tier devices. Um, the last part is some words about uh, the basic principle of transcatheter mitral aneuploplasty. It was uh, 10 years ago, um, yeah, a very a big um, yeah, target of the uh, development to uh, mimic the mitral aneuploplasty, which you can see here by an aneuploplasty ring and it should be transferred to a transcatheter approach, and this is an example of the uh, cardio band implantation. It's a flexible band, and this band is fixed by different anchors directly in the annulus, and after the placement of these uh, anchors, which you can here uh, see very nicely, you have the option to cinch the whole system, which should lead to a reduction of the uh, mitral uh, annular uh, diameter and uh, at the end to a reduction of the mitral regurgitation. But the, the, uh, um, the bad news is that these systems are currently not uh, available uh, for the mitral side. Uh, um, Edwards has currently stopped uh, this program. I have heard that they are working on new devices. One of the key problems is uh, the anchoring of this uh, ring. Uh, for example, you need different sizes of anchors. You know that uh, can lead to some trouble with the circumflex artery. Also, the second device, the millipede device, which is also a direct aneuploplasty device, is currently not in the clinical routine available, and our clinical uh, study is uh, on the way. And on the right side, you can see the Carillion system. The Carillion system is an indirect aneuploplasty device. Uh, you can see that this device is placed in the sinus coronarius and should lead to a reduction of the mitral regurgitation, but this is less effective compared to the mitral clip devices and also to the direct aneuploplasty devices and plays no role in the current clinical routine. 
In conclusion, um, TIR is a very safe and feasible in uh, selected patients. It is a treatment option for elderly and high-risk patients. Um, the indication is based on the patho mechanism and the treatment goal. Aneuroplasty devices um, are needed for long-term clinical results, but currently less effective or not available. And the main point is uh, that the treatment of mitral rotation should be performed uh, in a multidisciplinary team in experienced heart valve centers. And uh, this is the last point, tier and also aneuplasty devices are just only one tool in the mitral toolbox for the treatment of mitral regurgitation. And that is the reason why a um, discussion with cardiologists and also cardiac surgeons is very important for the indication uh, for the treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thilo, thanks a lot.